it's crazy because in the midst of this, I used to tell my mom, you know, as long as I don't die in this journey, you know, I'm going to get to the back end. I'm going I'm to I'm 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 get through it and I'm going to be okay. I couldn't put everything into two, three hundred pages. The biggest thing I wanted, I, I, I pride myself on was that no matter what on this journey, if I got up in the morning and looked myself in the mirror, I could live with myself. Growing up in Richmond, man, uh, younger, people got to think I'm 35 now. Everybody know if you from this area, you know, Richmond was a murder capital. As a kid, you don't really feel that until you grow up and look like, damn, shit was kind of wild, crazy. I'm, I'm born in 88, but the 90s, like, it was a wild time. So George was born February 8th, 1988. Me and his dad weren't together like you might think we together. Like, we were, like, off and on, off and on. My dad's a unique guy. He got a lot of kids, a lot of us. Some we still finding out about. <laughs> you know, in all seriousness, you know, I was always called Lil George because of him. My dad's a legend. It's probably gonna be a statue up of him around Northside for sure. Um, I tell a story how, you know, me growing up, my dad wasn't just my dad. My dad was the dad of like hundreds and hundreds of niggas across the state. And I'd be places where people are older than me and be like, yo, you Lil George? And I'd be like, yeah. They'd be like, man, your dad, my dad. And I'd be like, damn, that's crazy. Like, but my dad really was. His dad would pick him up, then they would go around the hood and pick up everybody else. He was like, I always gotta share my dad with them, blah, blah, blah. I was like, well, you know how your dad is. He would be like, after practice, everybody wanna go to McDonald's. His daddy didn't wanna pay for everybody to go to McDonald's. So little George would be like, dog, you're not gonna take me either? And he's like, no, everybody gonna eat when they get home. Little George would be like, if all of them on in the car, I could've went to McDonald's, you know, so. Oh, I got some pictures of y'all, man. Hey, that's crazy. Break back memories. I had to go get these on? pictures fit, huh? What I got on? Everything. Your mama thought you was going off pole. Hey, hey. hey, bro, this nigga just let this nigga bring his gun to practice, bro. <laughs> <laughs> they hey. were crazy, man. I told hey, I tell people, I used to say, let me have your guns for the practice. Oh, hey, don't do like that. Bring his gun to practice, bro. <laughs> that shit, wow. It started around Northside. I started out my schooling at Gnarl. That gnaw is now like knocked down. They got a new gnaw. But that's kind of like my first interject. You know, this is Northside, the heart of Battery Park. That's where I played Ray. Right. That's kind of like where it all started at. I don't know, it's kind of nostalgic coming back here because I ended up going to a bunch of schools. That's how I know so many people. But the first school I ever went through was, was gnaw. This don't been closed for years, whatever case may be. But this is my original elementary school I went to kindergarten, first grade. Just coming back here, this is, you know, your first school that you go to. I remember like nap time. I remember going through these doors. I remember the flagpole. My grandma, she stayed around the street, so we spent a lot of time over there, Grandma Lily. Everything was in this little circle right here. This is where everything started off at. This was like the pinnacle of every day after school, every day in the summer, even after I left, because you know, I transitioned to not living around here. I would still have a way to get over here at the school. Everybody look, look, everybody see you right? Look, everybody know who they kick it Look. This shit crazy. I played in the first game at this field. You get a feeling of home that it don't matter where you go, home gonna always be home. And you just start thinking about just all the crazy shit that we was doing, all the niggas I used to be with. How life didn't just evolve. Just coming out here, you just naturally go right back to like, damn, when I'm seven, eight, nine, ten. And I think about, I think I was out here, nigga, me, Pip, all everybody that you know associate, like, we, this is where we was at. This is where our life started. Yeah, I'm still hanging there. What's up, Joe? What are you yeah, doing, Joe? What's up, man? Uh, hanging, man. Hanging, bro. I remember niggas coming here and say that drugs, everything. <laughs> it's funny now, but, nah, this. It's the mecca of Northside, like where I'm from, with Battery Park. That's where I perfected my shot at. In here. You think about like where I took it. But it, it start, you know what I mean? Starting here, just making 100 free throws and 
You know what I mean? You know, he had so many basketball influences around him. The main one was his brother. Little George was a little gym rat, okay? We would go to all the games. And he was a two-year-old. He would sit right beside me in the chair. He got to the point where he would just kind of look up at me like, can I go? And I would say, okay, you can go. So he was like this tall though, you know, like somebody could have stepped on his head. And I was like, you hold on to the banner. So it's like I always had a sense of faith with him. Yeah, I got my father and my father definitely always been like around and played his role. You know, I never, I never lived with my father. Should nobody ever live with my father. But, um, you know, I live with my mom. And my mom, it was me, and my brother Lamar. What those times looked like for me, you know, my, my brother was a phenom in regards to basketball. He was just always it. He'd been, he, he was always it um, on the court. Growing up, I was always, you know, the, the little brother. Um, I always was just sitting back, just watching this show go on, day in and day out, just like how good my brother was in basketball. And all of our lives was like molded around that. You know, I watched my mom, you know, if I'm two, my brother's 12, we were just on the road, traveling, wherever my brother was playing ball at. So that's kind of like all I knew. Our journey together just as a unit was just went on and basketball was the root component year round um, for us. As, we, as I evolve as an as a older man, as a teen and, and, and transition to like the trouble I get into, my mom was always like that. She never turned her back to me. We, we definitely bumped heads some shit at times, but she was just always there. And as you know, I progress, and now I'm my own man. And her other other son, Lamar, became an older man. I became, you know, self-sufficient, and she saw me that I was kind of different, and I wanted to move different. And she always just aided me to just like, yo, you got the you you got the juice, like whatever you want to do, like take it there. Little George was always so smart. Like one time, I told him. And I think, and it did hurt his feelings, because he told me it hurt his feelings. And I told him, I said, you know, you're so smart. Basketball is not gonna be your forte. You're gonna do something else because you're so smart. Never forget it in this room. And it hurt his feelings because he was determined to exceed in basketball. He had seen his brother exceed in basketball, and that was truly in his spirit. I just was keying into him and planting seeds that you are so smart, you can do whatever you want to do. But at that time, he thought I was putting him down in basketball and saying that he wasn't as good as his, as his brother, but that's not what I was doing. My mom knew my true, my first passion was basketball because that's all I knew. But this, this mindset of just like, that's what they doing over there, I'm gonna go over here. My mom was always for it. Um, I, I share in the story where, you know, I started sewing. My mom was like, who the hell gave you a sewing machine? But she won't never like, fuck no. Like she was always like, that's what he owned, that's what he owned. Even my journey to on basketball, me going to a private school, my mom like kicked me out because I was like, nah, I'm gonna go reclassify and I'm gonna go to a private school. And she was like, boy, who the fuck wanna go backwards and shit like that. It was literally 10 o'clock at night and I was in my room looking at TV. I never forget it, I can still see it. He come in the room, he said, Mom, I want to reclassify. So I didn't know what he was talking about. I was just laying down at first, just chilling. I was like, what is, what you talking about? He said, well, that would mean I go to a prep school and I do the 11th grade over again. I sat up, I said, you out of your mind? Why would you want to do the 11th grade over again? He said, reclassifying is, I, I could, cause he was just a C student, cause he was too much of a little socialite. And on the basketball, he was just a C student at Verina. And so he would be like, no, nah, Ma, I want to get my grades up for school. He said, so reclassifying is I go to a prep school and I do the 11th grade all over again so I can be on the honor roll. I said, you have got to be out of your mind. I said, that's like going backwards, right? I had sat up in the bed then. And then he kept talking. I said, get out of my room. <laughs> get out. I started doing my homework. He mentioned Heritage Christian. I looked up Heritage Christian, like I started doing my homework. Then I knew what reclassification was all about. Long story short, 
he, we re, he reclassified and he started going to Heritage Christian. You know, of course, we were already doing the AAU thing. We would travel anyway. Aaron, one of his best friends, came over to Heritage Christian because he brought Aaron in. He was like, Ma, I got to get Aaron to come over here with me. I'm like, what? Okay. So Aaron came. Me and Ronnie been stuck at the hip since sixth grade. I think I met Ronnie in fifth, like the summer of going to sixth grade, we, you know, we played ball. He was a South Side nigga, I'm from North Side. We ain't even supposed to be like locked in like that. Nigga just been my dog, man. It started out, I went to Manchester with those guys. Them niggas still the reason why I got kicked out because they didn't tell me when the police was coming in when I was rolling dice. You know, Ronnie just became part of my family, man. Like my dad kind of took him in. You know, he he ain't have his dad. It'll be times that I call my dad. I'm like, what you doing? He's like, no, I'm over here. I picked up Ronnie. I'm like, what the fuck? I'm over here. How you pick up me? And so, you know, he got his own relationship with my dad. And me and Ronnie just spent every summer together since sixth grade, just on the road. But like basketball just always been like the glue to us. I met Keith. Of Keith was a basket in the basketball space as well. He used to be at like camps and everything, and I used to always get treated like the special kid because like my brother and I knew like all the people, all the league niggas and stuff like early. So like I used to come and be like, you know, they, we all the same age. We're like, oh, I'm not with y'all because like I know all these niggas type shit. So it was always like this vendetta, like, yo, who the fuck is this little light skinned nigga? And everybody, he good, but he ain't like that good type shit. So that was like this relationship. But when I moved to the East End, um, me and Keith got real close of a. Uh, when we got to Verona. I don't know, me and him just was always on the same type of time, just I guess we were two light-skinned niggas, and that relationship just, you know, grew. Uh, his younger brother, Sal, that became like my younger brother. At the same time, how like Ronnie was like my best friend over here, but Ronnie was like a Southside nigga, and me and Ronnie used to be together every day. Me and Keith used to be together every day, but for some odd reason, it never merged. It was like always like, I'm over here doing the day, and then I'm over here in the afternoon. And like Ronnie knew a nigga named Keith, and Keith knew a nigga named Ronnie, but like it never came together. And I ended up progressing and leaving around to go to the prep school with Ronnie. But now at this time, you know, camps and all these different type of things, the relationship started getting closer and closer and closer, where we just became like a unit together. Keith, uh, me and Keith's relationship, you know, Keith played in my, not in my conference, but we was able to compete. In, in college basketball, like I definitely beat him more than he ever beat me. We made like all state in college together, and um, we just spent all these summers. Now you know, me and Keith is like competing at a high level in college basketball. So our whole life became like one. His mom, you know, a cook before we go out at night. Just you know, all these experiences together. He was a funny little nigga from the jump. You know what I'm saying? We just always joking, but bro always. I could tell we had like the same mindset towards staying at that young age, like trying to hoop and trying to prove ourselves. Cause like I said, we was the smallest ones there. Being that size, you gotta have a, a, a certain type of mindset to, for, for them guys to respect you. It's funny how many similarities we had, the same mindset towards basketball. We had that. We like girls the same, the same way, you know what I'm saying? And then his mindset towards uh, just getting to, getting to a check, getting to a dollar at that young age, Starting what you need in 2012, we had just finished basketball. We was living together, both trying to figure it out. We were just always taking risks. Like, bro, like, he like, yeah, I'm just gonna go up here and, 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 and be with Ma, and I'm gonna learn how to do the billing and do all this. We like, bro, you, never, you didn't even go to school for this. Like, you know what I'm saying? I'm gonna do that, and, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, uh, and then I'm gonna uh, be a counselor. I'm like, all right, I'm gonna try to figure something out too. That type of, just stay in the course, and then at the same time, trying to keep figuring out new ways to get to where we where we saw ourselves. We never really had a conversation of like where we where we saw ourselves when we when we get to 35, but I think we both had the same mindset like, yeah, this is where we are supposed to be at. It was amazing to see him, you know, lead the team at Heritage and lead the team at Miller School and of course, the next stop was EMU. EMU, man, it's like a roller coaster. It's a situation where you don't really know the value until down the road and after you get through it and you look back and, and reflect. EMU, those four years, man, in my, in my life has molded me and, and, and put me on a trajectory where, you know, for the rest of my life, I'll forever pull or, or be grateful of just all the tools and just the morals and principles that I, 
I gathered or just molded during that time period. And it started with basketball, just, you know, how close me and my head coach, uh, Coach Dean, got. And just, you know, how the work ethic that I perfected at EMU, just on the court by myself, all those hours, all that sweat and tear and just pain that I pushed myself through, how in that time period it seemed like the biggest thing going on in your life, like basketball and college. Not knowing that time period would translate into just my work ethic in the corporate world, the relationships, how to maintain or, or, or work on relationships, how to articulate, how to conduct myself in certain different environments. It, it's just, it's beyond years. You know, some people, you meet some people in your life and you have chemistry from the, the very moment you meet them. And I'm telling you, George and I communicated at a level like we'd known each other our whole lives. The very second we sat down together at Miller, I could take you over there right now, walk you right into that place and set you at the table we were at, show you exactly where we were. That's how vivid the memory is to me. Um, and, and the moment I started talking to him, it just felt like he was my point guard. And we had a great time that day. And I said, hey, the next step is you got to come for a visit. Season was over. We were still in school. And I'll never forget, we had him play with our guys. And there were four or five recruits there that day. And our team was all there. And they went out and played. The coaches couldn't watch, but we'd kind of stand off to the side. And when guys would walk out of the gym, we'd have conversations about what was going on. And George walked out at one point, And my assistant, Greg Smith, said, hey, George, tell me, tell me what's going on in there. And George gave him a little breakdown, and, and Coach Smith said, well, who's the, you know, who's the best player? He wanted to hear George's opinion as to who the best player was on our team because we had seniors in there. We had rising seniors playing with them and juniors. We had our whole program in there, and then we had four or five really good recruits. And, and he said, George, who, who do you think the best player is? And deadpan, without any hesitation, no thought whatsoever, George looked right back at him and dead straight said, well, coach, I mean, I'm the best player out there. He said, now, don't take me, don't get me wrong. You've got some other kids that can play, but I'm clearly the best player. And then just kept walking. There was, he didn't smile. He didn't giggle. His, his, his face didn't go up on the side to show that he was, there was, there was nothing funny about that to him. And he was the best player. And he came and, 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 and the rest is kind of history. George became a starter immediately. And he had a couple other kids with him. Todd Phillips and DJ Henson and Ori Poncion. I'm not, I don't think they started quite as quickly as he did, uh, but eventually they were kind of the core of what was going to become the best team in the history of the school. After the sophomore year, uh, I think people knew we had something brewing. Now, when I say people knew we had something brewing, that means they thought they got a chance to be middle of the pack in the ODAC, maybe get into the upper echelon, you know, maybe and maybe break the school record for wins, which sadly was only 16. And of course, that 2009-2010 that season, uh, George had a phenomenal year. I had a lot of kids that would fall under this heading, but, but George is at the front of the line. He's one of those kids that the relationship that I had with him that had really little to do with basketball just made me a better person. George and I are from very different situations. He's a, 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 a Richmond kid, a city kid, a black kid. I'm a, I'm a white guy from the country. I always really treasured those relationships uh, because the, the color of the skin or where the kid came from never mattered to me. It all went back to what I said earlier. It went back to what he had in his heart. And I think the thing that drew us together was that neither of us are perfect. Both of us are, are, can make mistakes, and we have, and probably will continue to at times. But at the core of us, we're, we're, we're good people, and we care about people, and we love people, and we want to do what's right. And I think that commonality trumps everything else, that it speaks to the world, that all these things that, that, that people try to, to find ways to come between people and make people fight and argue and not get along and have all these reasons why the chemistry shouldn't be there, it can be meaningless. It, it, you don't have, you have to have certain things in common. And if you have that in common, then none of that other stuff matters. And now looking back, being out of school for 10 years and now being honored and Hall of Fame and now becoming an ambassador of the university, speaking at the school and being champion is crazy. Because this is my documentary hell. A lot of people don't know that. And I reference, you know, me basically being put on 
before a board at EMU to being kicked out or expelled due to me having a child. 10 years had passed and literally the same people or that board that had me on the chopping block, they came and personally apologized to me and offered me that I want my shattered, uh, shredded file of that time period. And um, you know, I never was seeking for no apology or I didn't even know that could be a thing. But when those people came and did that to me, it was like an emotional thing, like, damn, that, that trauma or that experience, you know, I didn't even realize that was like something I was doing. I thought this was just regular when them trying to kick me out. But when they came and apologized publicly in front of like, you know, the whole auditorium, it was just like, damn. And so it gave me a whole nother level of respect. And I look at those years as even more of just a monumental time for me. And, you know, I'm appreciative for it. Yeah, so that night that we was out here, we was for Keith's graduation. Man, I swear it was like 10 of us. We hit a, a roar up there. That, that was like a spot that we used to go all the time. It's 2.30 in the morning, whatever the case may be, drunk, super drunk, and we didn't left the pack, and then we started walking up this street. Now, we knowing that we parked on this street, but I'm like, shit, we'll walk with them. They parked on that street down there. We'll walk with them and just loop through to come get in our car right here. So I'm like, perfect. So we leave right here. The girls leave, I'm like, yo, I'll holler y'all later. Knowing that we parked on this other side, boom, we're gonna hit this alley and come through here. So we coming through here, and after the, after the club fashion, niggas had to pee. It's, it's pitch black. I'm coming around here, it's like five dudes across the street and was talking to them, but it wasn't none of my business, so I kinda like just went this way, like going up the street. The club is letting up up there, but I can hear the dudes like, shit, where you from, where you from? The dude that was with me was kinda like, what you mean where I'm from? What you mean where I'm from? So I instantly like put my phone in my in my hand and I look at the, the dude, and this used to be my friend. I looked at him, they was getting aggressive, like, nah, like what you what you got? So I remember pulling up my pants and like running, like jogging over here like this. Simultaneously, at the same time, when I ran over here, the dude that used to be my friend ran down that corner. So now I'm like right here in this area with these five dudes, and they kinda like, well, what the fuck you was about to do? And I'm kinda like, damn. I know Keith, I know Sal, I know all of them up there. The friend, little brother, all of them, they, they up there. I remember like being my back against the wall, like right here, and niggas trying to rob me. I'm fighting five niggas like this, literally this same spot right here. Like, damn, where's my niggas? They gotta see this going on. And one of the dudes was like, man, hold on, I'm about to just shoot this nigga. And so I remember getting hit and like falling a little bit out on my ground, but knowing that, not, not on the ground, but I remember thinking like, damn, I gotta get up out of this situation. So I have rushed one of the dudes on, on this side, and now I'm like running fast as hell back up the street right here. Like my face fucked up, this and that, right there. I got hit with the gun in my mouth. I had like a concussion. But shit, fuck all that. I'm trying to get up here to safety. And I'm running thinking that the dude gonna shoot me in my back. I get all the way up here. Keith and everybody is up here. They like, yo, what happened, what happened? I'm just like, bro, this nigga, this bitch ass nigga ran type shit, and I'm like, niggas try to rob me and whatever the case may be. And I got up out of there. The dude that ran ended up calling, keep saying that, man, somebody was shooting at me. This line, he, he, he here just ran. It transitioned to me, you know, getting back to EMU. Two days after and trying to work out, and that's when we found out my thumb was torn. And of course, the next step was that I was about to go work out for my agent, Cross Seas, where in, Ve in Vegas to go play Cross Seas. And, um, it ended up being, the, at the end of the day, the end of like my professional, you know, opportun my, my opportunity to go play professional basketball. Coming right here is like surreal to really go through the same alley, walking through in my head what it happened. Shit, it's crazy how life worked out because what if that didn't happen? And, and what if I would have kept my contract and when it played cross seas, like people at that point in time, I thought like that was the biggest thing I wanted to happen to me. That was like my dream. But it's like, maybe maybe stuff went how I was supposed to go. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, I ain't die. My thumb, everybody in my hands all messed up, but I mean, maybe it went how I was supposed to go. And that's just how I look at it now, instead of just harping on the goofy dude that was with me and anything like that. It's just like, it went how I was supposed to go. Everybody was supposed to move how I was supposed to move, and you know, it worked out. I wanted to be transparent and, and, and just put it all out there, but I knew how sensitive and how, you know, just being a man, you 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 don't get you don't really get to express a lot of stuff how you genuinely feel. But fuck it, this the, this the documentary. No one knew I was in a situation where I was about to be gone for ten years. 
when it first started, he won't, it won't nothing on him either. He was getting interviewed just like me. It won't no pressure on him. When, when the shit hit the fan and, and, and Ma did what he did, it was like, oh damn, this shit is serious. Bro, I gotta get a lawyer, a real lawyer. I'm not talking about like no, no bullshit lawyer. You go down and you know, pay the nigga $700 to get you. Nah, I'm talking about a real lawyer. I think everything kind of hit at the whirlwind because shit, life was good, we were lit. Niggas had everything they wanted. You know, penthouses, cribs, our main office was on West Hammer. All of a sudden, the feds came and, you know, fuck with bro life, but it, it, it hit everybody. Shit they, shit, they pulled up on my mama crib. I was banking with Wells Fargo at the time. They called me up was like, man, come get come get your money. Like, you, we can no longer bank with Wells. I was like, God damn, they could do that. I didn't even know they could do stuff like that without even a, no type of conviction, no type of anything, you feel me? Once that happened, our business went left as well. It was kind of like back to rock bottom again. But we were still pushing the envelope business-wise, even though bro had the feds against him, you know what I mean? Brian don't get a lot of light. Ronnie still moves like he is like a criminal or something, which he's not a criminal. He just be in the background. And if you know, you know Ronnie right there beside me or behind me. Me and Ronnie mo really moved to Houston like with a dollar and a dream while like businesses was failing. And um, we made it happen. Me and him really connected in a, in a certain kind of way that people don't really know unless you know. I really didn't understand the depth of everything. It was turning into something else. And I had no clue what it was really turning into. At the same time, she knew how much like I loved my brother and I wanted to be like my brother and um, my brother couldn't do no wrong and, you know, just as a kid. And she knew that at the same time, as I got older and started to see things on my own light, where I kind of was hurt where my relationship with my brother, well, you know, just kind of went left and I just was just kind of hurt and torn. And, you know, at a certain extent, I kind of knew that I had to go my separate way. And I didn't mean no harm and no malicious because this is who I grew up wanting to be like. And as my story progressed and everybody, you know, read my story and everybody know what happened, man, I was so hurt and so lost on like, why would my brother do that to me? I kind of just started breaking down on everybody, even her. Me and her had a period where, shit, you know, I, I kind of, I didn't know if she was with me. And I questioned her and I kind of turned my back on her. And that's just how, how lost I had gotten, how just the lonely space that I was in. And I didn't know why or, or who, would, who would hurt me. And so me and her relationship got uh, tested in the midst of that. Um, but, you know, we was able to get through it and, and, and get to, you know, to, to the back end and, and, get, and, and be okay. It probably was the most uncomfortable thing I had to do. Uh, I don't think to this, to, I don't think a lot of people don't know the extent of like where I had got mentally where I felt that I, did, I really didn't have nothing no more. My mom was, my, I thought was aiding this situation against me. Uh, and I literally, I never had disrespected my mom to that level no more, but I basically was like, fuck her. Big, shit, that's just where I was at. It was me versus the world and I couldn't understand why and I couldn't, I wasn't open to understanding or anything. Just like if I saw it was that way, that's that's where that, that's where I was standing on it. And a crucial moment is when my mom told me that she was diagnosed with cancer. And it kind of reeled it in for me, just the perspective of like, damn, like it's something is is bigger than this. And you know, it was really a life on the line. And that was kind of the beginning stages of where we started to begin closer and closer. And that was in the middle of this federal journey right before the second wave of charges came my way. I can't possibly um, tell you verbally now how devastating it all was because God has gotten me through it. Right? And I'm blessed to even be here sitting with you because 
I truly felt like I was going to lose my mind. And um, I think I did lose my mind for a while. It's just that I held on to my faith and walking the floors in the midnight hour. I'm sitting here with you today in my right mind, but I'm pretty sure I lost my mind. I'm pretty sure. Um, because the whole region, the whole city, thought I had two little prints. I, had raised, I was the mom and I was a single mom who had raised two prints who never they played, they were both little basketball stars, and they're like, that's what really happened. And so, it was really, it, I was devastated out of my mind. Well, I remember um, him meeting with his lawyer one day and coming over to the house after that, because he was flying back and forth, back and forth from Houston here to meet, meet with his lawyer. Um, the first lawyer didn't work out. I remember us sitting in the first lawyer's office one day, and I asked the lawyer, how many cases with, with the feds have you won? And he told me none, because he never fought a case. I was like, oh, it's time to go. <laughs> I didn't say it right then, but when we got outside, I was like, that's over. He's not the one. We got to find somebody who has dealt with the feds and who has won some battles. So. Um, God did lead us to a very good attorney. But the day that stands out in my mind was he had came in um, from Houston. He had met with his lawyer. He came over to the house one day and he was sitting at the island. And he was like, Ma, they want me to take a plea within 24 hours or they say I'm going to prison. And I just lost it. I just lost it. It was like we at the end of a road. It just looked, it just looked so bleak. And like I just remember falling apart that day and just crying uncontrollably, like uncontrollably. And he was like, I'm not taking no plea, Mom. So we just ain't know what was going to happen. Like my mind was just blown. I was like, oh, my God, what do I do now? So that, that really stands out amongst a lot of other things that, you know, some of the devastation, God has literally blanked it out. Truly, he has blanked it out. I was trying to be both of their moms as I had always been. Um, yeah, I was just trying to be both of their moms. And, you know, I was certified to the grand, I had to speak in front of the grand jury. And I was trying to save both of them at the same time. I don't know how, but, and certainly I couldn't practice, but I was trying to save both of them at the same time. And I remember saying things in front of the grand jury that led them to I was trying to say, say things that would save both of them from going to prison. Because I was getting ready to lose both of my sons at the same time. It was unimaginable for me. Um, so the things that I was saying to Mar were things that a mother would say to him in his situation. And the things that I was saying to little George was what I felt like I needed to say to him in his situation. I miss little George being um, that naiveness that he had. It's all gone away now. Um, like he's still my son, but he's, he's so hard, you know, he's real hard and tough about everything. Not with me, but with other people. Like he doesn't trust a lot anymore where he used to just trust so openly from his heart. He doesn't do that anymore. So I miss that in my son. I miss that. I miss that a lot. Um, and I just, I just miss that little naiveness in him. 
that used to be there so just so freely, that's all gone away. But he just turned 35 years old, so. Um, but I tell you one thing that really stood out and really touched me so deeply. He did a video for me and he sent it forth to me because at first I know he didn't want me to be even dealing with Ma anymore. Like he truly didn't want that. And nobody told him to do this video, but he did a video just for me, like setting me free to still be both of their moms. And I have a copy of it. He wrote it on paper and he read me this thing like, Mom, I don't think I would have made it through this without you. He said, and, but I'm sitting here now to let you know that. I know that you're still my brother's mother. And he was like setting me free to still be his mother. Like nobody told him to do that. He did it on his own and that just shows what kind of heart he has. So I just love him so much. I love both of them. And um, my prayer is just that I don't leave this earth and God not some kind of way Put them back together as brothers. Like I don't want to leave this earth and they not be brothers anymore. They haven't been brothers in a while. Like little George was just so crushed. So, but I know everything's gonna be all right. My joy right now is that I have joy in little George and seeing his accomplishments on the other side of it all. And I have joy with Mar seeing his accomplishments on the other side, I just wish I could be in the room with them again. You know, dealing with the case on my own with just me and my attorney, you know, that was like a years and years of progress, uh, of, of progression and just stuff that we did. But once, you know, and people watch movies and stuff, but once you become, you, you take a, a charge, you know, it's a whole separate moment where you get sentencing. And at that moment, you're really leaning on the judge being f f nice and people of your community and higher up and the personal relationships of people just speaking on your behalf. And some people would take it and be like, oh, I got you and they don't do shit for you. But like, it's an important, it's an important piece because it's the only way that you know, a judge can sit back and try to get a snapshot of like your, your morals and principles. And just think about what it looked like if somebody can't speak on your behalf and nobody gonna be like, nah, I, I fuck with him, or he good, or he did this good deed. It looks crazy. But it looks very good if people in, in higher up, or, or it don't have to be higher up, or just people just dearly will write and speak on your behalf. And I remember reaching out to just people and, and, and and the outpour of seeing people write a letter to a third party about just experiences that they had with me and something that I probably forgot that I even did or, or, or what, I, what I was to them reading that and that, and that point in my life was just like, damn. All of those letters and, and people that spoke was like, all of them way the same, but all some of them was just different, unique because everybody you know, writing a letter for one person and for the other person is like a whole different kind of task. I play a vital role with like a, young, a lot of younger niggas that move in a different kind of space that I don't necessarily move in, but I'm trying to get them to where I'm going. It, it, get, it get touchy or emotional when I speak about these young niggas because it's just a real life and, and they live in it every day. And uh, Shaw at the time, which has been connected at the hilt with my blood nephew Pip. Me and his relationship just was just had got so had got at that point so tight and so deep. It's a guy that been in prison his whole teens. Around the time that I was going through this, he was already in prison. And 
I would say mentorship, but I don't even kick it on some like big homie, like mentor, like I'm your mentor type shit. It's like, nigga, I'm with y'all. I just, I'm a little bit older, so I got a little bit more wisdom and I got access to certain shit, so I'm gonna share it with y'all niggas and I'm gonna, I'm gonna be right in, in it with y'all. Shot a rapper and I was able to start a record label. That was a way to pull them out of, you know, whatever the fuck they doing. But, you know, I shared with Shaw, like, damn, bro, like, I'm facing this type of situation. And, you know, penitentiary shit is just regular. And they think that shit is regular. To me, I'm like, what the fuck? And he like, man, I love pussy shit. <laughs> so he knew the value of, like, letters. Man, from in jail, I told him, like, man, like, write a letter. I'm going to give you my attorney address to send it. And the nigga wrote a letter, but my attorney kind of was like, what the fuck is, what, what is going on? And uh, he basically just in the letter was just explaining how, like, what I was to him, how, like, you know, his family, his mom, his dad, everybody around him had been writing him off, like, when he was a kid, when he was a child, when he was in, in prison as a kid, and that he never had nobody come around and believe in him and, like, really take him serious and talk to him every day and, just aid whatever idea he got, and just just genuinely be there. What I said in the letter was, it's true. I'm a victim of this society. I'm a vic I am the product of young black America, of what happens when you leave somebody, this, 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 when you show them this struggle. Here it is, I know what the charges was that he had, and you know, any crime is a, is a crime. You can't, it's in, any crime, but he ain't do something to poison your community. Look at the good he was doing. He pulling us out of poverty. He's showing us that hard work pays off. No, you don't have to hit the corner. You can hit the books and you can get the same outcome or a better outcome if you just stick to it and remove yourself from your environment. I told the judge, you know, he don't have to, I'll do the time. Just give me what I got. And it's a better with him out here than at the time of me being out here. For all the all he did for me and then created for my life to be at a greater withstanding what I am at now, shit. <laughs> I go do the time. It ain't nothing but a goddamn, like I used to tell him, you ain't gonna get that long. Shit, you get a couple, couple years a day. I ain't tripping about that for real. Shit, I'll be back. Leading up to my sentencing, my attorney was like, there's no way you're gonna have to do the feds or the prosecutor not coming up all you not going to prison. Like at minimum, you're gonna have to do a year. My sentencing was nine o'clock in the morning, and so my briefing was the night before. And I went and saw my attorney, and my attorney was pissed off. He was like, George, your oldest brother is coming as a witness against you. What the fuck can we do about this? The first go round was your brother Lamar. This go round, it's your oldest brother. And like, I remember just being embarrassed to this, my attorney, the guy that I've been speaking to for four years, fighting for my life. And him just being like, like I let him down. Like, how the fuck could your older brother be coming in front of, you know, coming to do this? And I ain't had no answer for it. And he basically kind of just shook his head. He, <laughs> he made me pick where I wanted to spend my time at. Cause he was like, you, you're gonna go. So eat good tonight. You're not gonna have time to go call, make a phone call. They're gonna take you right when you get sentenced. And the only thing I could do for you right now, George, is uh, I can I can suggest where you wanna go spend your time at. A lot of people don't know that Pitt was in the feds. Pitt was at one of the uh, best facilities that you could go to. They had like a gym and like all this good stuff. I remember sitting right there in my attorney's uh, office picking the same facility that Pip was at. And I remember leaving uh, leaving my attorney office and it was like two things I, I knew I had to do. I was called Brianna, my oldest daughter, and to find a way to will my way to tell her that I'm gonna be gone and to call Pip. And I called I called Brianna and uh, she's like, yo, what's up dad? Like in her own little spirit. And I'm like on the phone with her. And uh, she like, you know, like, what's up? I'm like asking her like stupid questions like, shit, what it feel like out there? And I couldn't really, I couldn't get it together. And uh, I remember she asking like, what's wrong, what's up with you? And I just like, nah, I'm chilling. It, I couldn't tell her. And I remember just getting off the phone like, well, shit, I'm gonna just holler at you tomorrow. And like, I ain't go to sleep that night. You know, we, we got to court the next day. My family, Keith, a couple of my young niggas was there, my uncle, my mom, family, friends were there. And if you know how like federal court set up, you come in, I'm on the left side, the prosecutor and the feds come in on the right side. I mean, shit, I wish this damn camera could have been there, but 
That nigga came in, my oldest brother came in with the federal government. I remember like looking back and just like, damn. Like a server, it's like some shit off a fucking movie. And to get to the point where, you know, it went how it went and the judge saying that they gonna go against everything the prosecutor want, that they never, he never did this. And they gave me federal house arrest. It was just like, <laughs> Remember my attorney whispered my end was like, George, my fucking 40 years, that never happened like before. And it's just a testament of just like, you know, God. And um, you know, it just won't written, it won't for me. You know, I, I was able, I was granted the federal house arrest. And Shah still had a lot of time left. Me and Shah actually, Shah had got out and actually was on on house arrest along with me. So me and him, that was my house arrest buddy. <laughs> we spent a lot of time. He ended up getting back off house arrest and going back to prison. Man, a lot of killing and a lot of murders happened. And he had to sit back and watch it from inside. And in June, you know, Shark was getting out in July, I believe. And um, Pip was murdered. Man, Shark a hands-on type of nigga, bro. Like, we, had, we went through a lot of stuff when he was in prison, but when Pip was murdered, you know, to just about to come home and, and you know, the guilt that Shark felt that he wasn't around because, you know, Pip was just different without, without, without Shark around. You know, Shad kind of carried that. And so, you know, to get sh to go get Shad out of prison and, like, to take him to where we just was at to bury Pip, it was just like, God damn, it was just tough. It's funny how, like, pain bring people closer and closer and closer and closer together, but, like, Pip dying and now me and Shad, like, the bond is just, like, it's a space where it's tough to even articulate. It's just, it's just a lot. It, just, it ain't nothing. It ain't nothing could break it. Like I could punch him in the fucking face. It, it just, it ain't nothing. It ain't nothing could break it. <laughs> Nigga. I told him from the joint what I was in there doing. Listen, my nigga. Listen, man. This nigga you see here, man, on my mama, man. Changed every nigga life, nigga. That's from the graveyard, nigga, to the streets, nigga. Like, no bullshit. We ain't had hope. Where I come from, nigga, we out there for real, nigga. We thugging. This who we seen making, nigga. And to pull us and want us to do the right thing, man, you got to salute it, man. My nigga told me from the cell, man. You ain't got to look back no more, man. I used to tell bro this, I said, man, what you going through right now, it's gonna change you. You Don't nobody like stay the same after you go do shit like this. As, as far as the betrayal from your, your family, the ones that you admired your whole life, that you've seen as role models, turn their back on you, and then also losing financially in the same time, you don't stay the same. Bro became a hero in a sense, right, because it's like, a lot of people want to look at the negativity aspect of everything, but he just made more awareness to a mental health guy, and he's always been a leader of culture in our community, you know what I'm saying, in our city. So be able to change the narrative and let guys know in our city, and I'm talking about from the inner cities to even the outskirts of the counties to know, hey bro, we as men, especially, especially African-American men, we go through things, and it's okay to seek help or, or get you know what I'm saying, the structure you need to survive it. Because a lot of us, we don't know how to go about it and we just fall off and shut and shut down. So to see him overcome that, I, you know what I'm saying, I look, up, I look up to him in those aspects, you know what I'm saying, to keep me going, you know, you know what I'm saying, even though my trials and, 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 and hurdles that I gotta go through, I can overcome it too. So, I mean, I look at him from an aspect and, and proud, a proud brother. So I'm Corinne Watt Carter, George's little cousin. I am known as a social serial entrepreneur, hustler, just like George. I'd always struggle with depression, uh, anxiety coming up. I feel like a lot of us do, right? And um, parents divorced, mom sick, single dad, just all of the things. Going through leaving grad school, 
I literally had my first real like dark hole of like depression. As a kid, wanting to not be here anymore because my life didn't look like what I thought or wanted it to look like. All I could think about while I was in grad school was the organization that I had started, which was Chase Dreams Not Boys, that I started at George Mason. At that point had over 300 members, women all across campuses, GMU, VCU, ODU. That was always my plan was to have my own business. I never knew what the business was going to be, but I knew me starting and mobilizing 300 girls across campuses meant that I could do something. Let me figure it out. And he kind of opened that door for me. I didn't know community-based mental health was a thing. So he introduced me to that world, and that's what he was doing with Ma up in Alexandria in the schools. And so he put me in a school in Hopewell, Carter G, and that's where I started my career. And a lot of those kids that I started working with that fall 2014 when school started, I still am taken care of to this day. But that's when day in and day out, I'm in a school with G, Keith, Cardo, like Ronnie, we in the school every day. Mental health was always business to G. And so again, being the only girl in this group full of guys, it's like, you gotta man up. Like this emotions, this shit that you're doing, he would come in the office and I'm crying cause, I didn't, cause we didn't had a meeting and everybody feels some type of way and this, that, and the third. So I go back in my room, I'm pacing, I'm crying. He like, yo, you gotta really chill. Like, this is not that serious. You know, this emotions and stuff you got, you gotta, this is money. Like, this is business. We got shit to do, you know? And we'll call him in the middle of an anxiety attack. Like, yo, I like screaming, crying, can't see nothing. Cause when you in them dark holes and when you having a panic attack, you don't see nothing else. You can't think of nothing else. It's, you have to find an anchor. And so oftentimes he would be an anchor, but he, he, would, he wouldn't have any empathy. Empathy for me because I'm his cousin, he loved me and all that type of stuff, but no empathy from the anxiety standpoint. And so when he actually started dealing with, because so much stuff was compounding on him, he was our way. He opened a door for us. So he took on all of our, all of our problems and all of that is, it adds up. And he was dealing with anxiety before he knew that was anxiety because nine times out of 10, if you working in mental health, you got your own therapist. Right. I am grateful that he has gotten to this point where he can take care of himself in a different way. And so for now, for him to come full circle and to add this layer of personalizing his journey with mental health, it's a big deal. People need to see that. People know that George is authentic and genuine. People know that when he says something, he's going to do it. When he says something, he means it. And so now for him to be able to speak and be that person for black men specifically, it's different. I always skip this part of just being honest with myself. What really did hurt me? What really bothers me? What things that I tried to like cover up or what things I tried to put a band-aid on and be like, I'm gonna get to later. It started there. And once I was able to do that, it's like, all right, what are some tools or, 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 or mechanisms that I could do to cope with these things? Or like, what would help me feel better about these things? And so therapy was the beginning stages for that. Me speaking to somebody that they didn't grow up with me, they don't, they're not biased. They have the tools to aid or help me guide or help me think about things in a certain kind of way. And that's what a therapist was for me. Starting there, I started looking for other things and that's what hot yoga was for me. And the hot yoga space was just a, me being an athlete and me just what sweating does for me. It, get, it give me this reset. Every time I go to hot yoga, what that does for me just mentally and just for my body is like something that I can't even put a monetary value on. It's just priceless. And I just wanted to use my personal story to springboard to start having these conversations about the trauma and, and the PTSD of what I went through might not be like the next person or the next man or the next woman, but to just start having this engaging conversation of just what mental health is and what it looks like. And just using my journey and the mental health struggles that I went through, still struggle with, and speak on it and be transparent and vulnerable and, and you know, share my story and it might trigger something for somebody else or start these conversations. My, my story is whatever you take from it, but at the end, I just wanted to motivate to let let people know you can pick yourself up from whatever your situation is my stuff man i got i know people's stories is way worse than mine and went through way more traumatic shit but mine's my story it's organic it's real but let's start having these conversations about mental health start these conversations where like what's your story and like what did that do to you and like okay that did that what did you do to cope with it 
What are these things that you did to deal with that? Because it ain't going nowhere. It happened. And, and you got to move forward. And so that was, that's really the gist. I don't care, you know, you ain't had to go through no street shit. You ain't had to go through my journey, but you gonna go through some hard times and something gonna knock you off your foot and something gonna redirect your plan or your journey that you had written out. But you really can come back from anything. As long as you don't die, like you really can come back and, and, and conquer everything. I mean, this is a dramatic story, but like, if this is a story that can tell you that, you know, it can still be done and you can, you know what I'm saying, keep flourishing on a, on a vertical progression, like, man, that, this is the best story to be told in, you know what I'm saying? Because bro already thought he won and then you knock him back down to the, to the, to the start line, you starting all over, you gotta make it happen again. But then to, to document that journey to let everybody else know, like, you know, you can probably do this too. If you're going through something greater or something smaller, you can do it too. Shit, for me, read the book, nigga. Like, it tell you, it ain't, niggas ain't faking. Read it. Like, the struggle is real and the shake back is real. Two years of a book being out, we're like, what are you getting close? Like, almost 10,000 copies? Come on, man. The book's speaking for itself. You can't deny real. You can't deny. You can't deny it when it's in your face, man. You can't deny the, the real, the feeling that you feel if you reading some of your hair stand up. You can relate. If you look at George, you wouldn't think none of this happened. And that's how you're supposed to carry yourself. That's and that's the main thing they be sure. Of. Don't let the stigma that the government or the system put on you. Bath that shit off. Dress yourself up. Spray a nice little cologne on and walk out that door with your head high. So if you ain't got the book, go get the book. It's official. It's no faking. It's a real life story. It's a real comeback. After this, we trying to do 50,000. So New York's bestseller. Because he already Richmond bestseller. I ain't trippin' on no niggas Yeah, I was sick of time, we ain't sick of time I ain't trippin' on no niggas Talk about when I ain't round I ain't trippin' on no bitch That don't even hold me down I got problems, I got pressure Shit that really need a blessing I don't know about you, but I'm sick and tired of stressing. I ain't trippin' on no niggas, talk about when I ain't round I ain't trippin' on no bitch, that don't even hold me down I got problems, I got pressure, shit that really need a blessing I don't know about you, but I'm sick and tired of stressing. Hope your loyalty don't change, they say Reggie dropped the name Feel my I remember calling Pip, and I never, sh I didn't put this in the book Because me and him had a conversation at that time But I remember calling Pip, and like, yo, like I'm gonna be coming there. And Pip being like, hell yeah, nigga, like, you straight, like, we got, nigga, you ain't gotta worry about shit. He on the phone with niggas in, in, in there with him, like, we got a point guard now, we about to win all the fucking games. <laughs> and like, in a fucked up weird way, it gave me comfort, cause it was the first moment that night of me accepting, like, damn, I'm going federal. And like, and at the lowest point of like my life, like in this moment, me calling him, it was like, this is my little nephew. I felt like, damn, niggas got me type shit. And it was like, it, it gave me some kind of ease, like because these niggas was really like, oh, uh, niggas is in there calling me, like, I don't even know these niggas. Like, uh, oh, nigga, oh, nigga, you got my spot. We gonna win all the games. They like talking shit to niggas, like we about to bust y'all ass next week, like type shit. And so, it was like, damn, like my mind had like switched at that moment, like fuck it, like I'm, I'm, I'm with the game, like fuck it, I'm, I'm like, this way as it came to. I remember telling him, I was like, bro, like your dad on my paperwork. <laughs> and in true like fashion, uh, it was like, fuck it, nigga, you my dad anyway, fuck that nigga type shit. So we laughing and everything, I was like, nah, bro, that's fucked up. He was like, nah, it's fucked up, but shit, G, nigga, like this is how it goes, he was like, fuck it. And I was just like, kind of like, we got the phone, kind of like, damn, I guess I'm gonna see you um, <laughs> when I check in type shit. I don't even know how it go, but, oh, he said some shit like, shit. He was like, you got like a year? He was like, I gotta do some shit so I could just stay out here, like, 
get in trouble, like to stay longer, like with me type shit. And I just was like, damn, like, you know, I'm, I'm your, I don't want you to have to do that. But like niggas was like, he literally was like, bro, I'll do some shit so I'll stay longer. And like, so I'll be here with you type shit to make sure you straight type shit. And I just was like, bro, I'll holler at you like when I get there. And like, boom, we get off the phone. Me and Keith went out for drinks. And before we went out, I called Pip. Pip's like, what the fuck? <laughs> How you, uh, no, Pip had called me. And uh, he was like, yo, like, what the fuck? I was like, bro, they gave me a year. He was like, yo, that's crazy. He was like, we had your jersey and everything, for <laughs> so, <laughs> And then, you know, and that's, that's kind of how that, that, that day or two went.